Philippians. And um, so I have a set verse that I am to teach on once a month. Last Sunday, while John was preaching, the Lord was talking to me about a different scripture. And um, later on during the week, John said to me, I felt like the Lord gave you a different word Sunday in church for next Sunday. And I began to weep because God is that way. And um, I said to him, I have a word, something that the Lord showed me, and it rocked my world. It changed the way that I look at reaching the lost. So I want you to turn to Acts 9, 1 through 19. And it's a little bit of reading, but we have time to read the word of God. I need my Bible. So most of you are probably familiar with this passage because this is the Damascus experience that we've heard people title sermons that way or, or that they've had a Damascus um, experience with God. And usually when I have heard this preached or I've read it myself, I, I really concentrate a lot on Saul. But today we're going to concentrate on Ananias. And so if, if I was ever to title a sermon, it would be this. Now there was a disciple named Ananias. So chapter 9. But Saul still breathing threats and murderous and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that he so that if he found any belonging to the way men or women he might bring them bound to Jerusalem now as he went on his way he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and falling to the ground he heard a voice saying to him Saul Saul why are you persecuting me and he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him to, by hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither did he eat or drink. And now there was a disciple at Damascus, and his name was Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here, here am I, Lord, he said. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on his, your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food he was strengthened. As the Lord began to show me and talk to me about Ananias in this, because he's kind of not the main character. I mean, we focus a lot on Saul. And what we know about Saul was that he was kind of a bad boy. You know, he was, he was after the Christians. He was, his desire was to kill and destroy the followers of the way, which we know is Jesus Christ. And um, so he had a pretty good reputation People knew about him, and I believe that people were fearful of him. And now it says that he had gone and basically got tags to hunt Christians. Basically, he had letters to the different synagogues in Damas Damascus to go gather them and take them to Jerusalem. We know what m mostly happened in Jerusalem was, was the killing of the saints. So it wasn't a little feat that Saul had this papers. 
And everybody knew he had the papers. So if you were a follower of the way, you knew it was probably only a matter of time. But then there was a disciple named Ananias. What do we know about Ananias? We know a few things about him, what the word said, and John helps me with all the study books and things like that. And we know that he was one of the 70. So that tells me that this is a man who really loved God. He was one of the 70. He probably personally knew Jesus, which I'm going to get there in a minute. He probably walked some with Jesus and knew Jesus, probably sat underneath some of his teaching. He had a relationship with God, we know, because he heard from God. But he physically, from what we're reading in the books, knew who Jesus was. He went to Damascus for safety against the prosecution, persecution of the Jews. So he went to Damascus, right where the most dangerous man was heading. God's hand was in this. God had a need for Saul. So he reached out to a man named Ananias, who was a disciple. He gave complete instructions to Ananias. He did not leave, it, leave Ananias to guess, do I go here, do I do this, do I do that? He said, you go here, here's this man, and you're going to lay hands on him. But Ananias says, wait a minute. This is the guy that I've heard about. I've heard that he's killing your people. I heard that he has the rights to hunt down my brothers and sisters in the way. And you want me to go to him? <laughs> right? Bible says that he questioned God. It's okay to do that. It's okay. God doesn't care. He said, wait a minute, God. This, this, and this. And God said, I get that, I see that, yet I have need of him. Ananias was the tool. Ananias' obedience is what we want to look at this morning. So God assures him that I know what I'm doing, and he quotes, Go, for he is chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. And he know I will tell him what he will need to suffer for my name's sake. So here we have Saul that again is making, he's going to have to make a choice to serve. And he knows because God's going to tell him, you're going to suffer for this. So Ananias obeys and he does what God tells him. And in his obedience, he changed the course of history. Why did he do that? If Ananias said, oh, I'm not going to do this, God, God still had need of Saul for, for his purposes, so God would have chose somebody else to get the job done. But I don't want to be second string, and I don't want anybody else to be second string for me. If God says, for me, Ginger, I need you. I have need of this situation. You need to go take care of this. I want to be able to say, I'm, I'm there. I'm there, God. So the Bible says that he goes into the house where Saul was, he says, um, I'm laying my hands on you. You have this to do. God wants you to do this. And he lays his hands on him. In fact, he addresses him as Brother Saul. So in that moment, in faith, he's saying, I know God's going to redeem him or has already redeemed him, and I'm going to call him brother. Even though I may be scared of him, even though all his past, even though all the stuff he's said, I'm calling this man brother because God said that I have need of him. So he went in, laid hands on him. It, the Bible says he was redeemed. Something like scales fell off of his eyes. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he ate and gathered his strength. Out of obedience, out of a disciple named Ananias, the course of history for Christianity changed in that moment because this man was obedient. I don't know. I don't know how I would have handled that. We have a situation, um, I have a personal situation that I'm 
a little bit removed from, but whenever the situation rises up or somebody says something about it, I want to come out swinging because somebody in my family has been hurt by this other person. And so I have deliberately began to plead the blood of Jesus on this person who is causing such evil and such hate and such pain for my family. I'm making myself do that. This is my Ananias moment. Because I don't feel it. I want justice. But God isn't telling me that that's my job. Right? Obedience was shown here, which also showed his immense love of God. How do we know that he knew God? Because he could hear God's voice. Right? He heard God's voice, and we know that he knows God because he was able to speak back to God. He had a conversation with God. It was not a one-way conversation. God said, I need you to do this, but God, and God said, still do it, and he went and did it out of obedience. So let's look a moment at what it means to be obedient. Are you guys called to be obedient? We are. And what does that look like? Can we be super religious and, and walk in just these few things that make us holy? What if we just walk in the Ten Commandments? There's so much more to it in the relationship with Christ than the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are good. I'm not saying go break all the Ten Commandments. They're good. But, but we need to be obedient in everything. Every single thing the Lord tells you to do. Sometimes the things he tells us to do is hard and painful, and it causes us to stress. I have, I inherited my grandmother's Bible. You guys have heard me talk about my four foot seven tongue praying warrior grandma, 4.30 in the morning, filling her house with tongues so that wake everybody up, praying. I got to, I got to have her Bible when she passed away. Inside her Bible is when kids got saved, blah, 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 okay? And then inside those pages, she has written in her own handwriting things, whatever she was hearing in church, and she would date them. So I began, when I inherited, to carry this Bible with me. And I took it to church everywhere. It was a King James. And so I say that because I'm an NIV girl, but I was raised King James, so I can totally understand what it was saying. But so I began to write in this Bible, just like my grandmother did. And I would see what she would write. And I would write something of my own next to this, next to what she would write. This was my Bible. When she died and I inherited that Bible, my grief was really deep because I missed her. She was with the Lord, and I was grateful, and I knew that. But my heart ached because she would pray for me all the time. We would call and pray. So I slept with her Bible. I would clutch it to my chest. The very word of God bringing me comfort in those morning hours when I know that she would have been praying for me and now she's in heaven. So this this Bible meant something to me. Four months ago, God told me to give that Bible away. And I'm like, you know, (laughs) that can't be, God. This Bible means a lot to me. It's my heritage. It means a lot to me. He said, give it away. And, I, and he had the person that I was to give it to. So I wanted to say, here, you can borrow it for like three or four weeks and then give it back to me. Right? No. Give it. So I did. I, I gave it. I said, this is my grandmother's Bible. Um, there's things all throughout the pages. Here. You can have it. So sometimes with obedience, We can regret, or it can hurt, and it hurt. And a couple times I needed that Bible. I felt I needed the Bible, my grandmother's Bible. So I had some regret setting in. Last Sunday morning, this person texted me a picture of the Bible opened to my grandmother's writing and my writing next to it because they had opened it and read it. It took months. But Sunday morning I sat there and I saw the ding come up and there's a little bit of crisis and so I checked it. And there's the word of God with my writing 
And I said, that's my writing. And then it starts clicking. See what God has done. He had need of my grandmother's Bible. My heritage is through Christ. I still have a Bible, my own Bible now that I'm writing in. There go my papers. But I gave something and it hurt a little bit. There has been times where God has said, give her the $60 that's in your wallet. Uh, that's the last money I have until payday. Give it. Yes, yes, Lord. I give it. And I don't even say, well, he's going to give it back to me tenfold. I don't do that. I give it because he told me to, not because of what I'm going to get. I get it. I gave it out of obedience. God will tell us more things than what's in here to do to be obedient. When we have relationship with each other, if we are to give something special to somebody in the church or send an extra card or give an extra phone call, be sensitive to be obedient because you don't know what's on the other end of that. God has need of those of, of the lost to be found. He has needs of our brothers and sisters to grow in him. And sometimes we are the tool that is needed to do that if we can get over ourselves. God's plans are always complete, and that's why I love this story. He saw what Saul had done, and I believe God's heart grieved. But God had a bigger plan that we didn't see at the moment. And so his plan was a disciple named Ananias. What if our lives looked like this? And then there was a disciple named Ginger. And then there was a disciple named Linda. And then there was a disciple named Brandy. Disciple, follower of Christ. What if our lives looked like that? What if 20 years from now, for me personally, I can stand up and say to you, we, you guys know that our friend Julia Phillips went to, moved to heaven. She lives in heaven now. And I can say, and then there was a disciple named Julia. Because she and her obedience changed the way I lived my life. She was the first one ever that allowed me to play the piano in church. And it was terrible. I, it was terrible. And I made terrible clunks. And, and it was like this. Dee, 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 dee. And that's what I did. And she was in the front pew. And then I left the stage. And I was like, I can't ever do that again. I'm terrible. I really went through this whole thing. And I turned, and because of her and her faith in me, I could say to the enemy, I'll be back up there next Sunday. And I was like, Julia? She goes, go ahead. There was a disciple named Julia who told me that to be a pastor's wife, I needed to have the height of a rhino because I was, I was griping one day. Sister Julia, she talked about me, and she really hurt me, and they're gossiping all about it. She said, here, she patted me and then fixed my hair, straightened my clothes, you're going to need to have the height of a rhino if you're going to be a pastor. And I was like, Ugh. I mean, at that moment, I was like, oh, can't you just go tell her to stop? But I needed to have a height of the rhino. So then I went home and studied what the height of a rhino meant. And you know what? She was right. And it is hard to kill a rhino. Not even darts. It's like this big thing to get through that hide. And that's what I needed to have to quit being... Um, easily offended. There was a disciple named Julia in my life. And we can look around this room, and I'm sure that there are stories, and especially since pastors Rusty and Linda are here, that there are times where we could probably look to them in this room and say, and then there was a disciple named Pastor Rusty. Right? And the children that are being raised here in this church can say, and then there was a disciple named Sandy, and then there was a disciple named Becca. Why? Out of obedience to the Lord, out of serving and getting over ourselves. I know I keep saying that. I started to reflect on the stories of the Bible about how God used different people to accomplish what he needed to accomplish. It's full of stories. And I'm just going to tell you, this part of my message came at like 5 o'clock this morning. So it is not in order, okay? <laughs> I just started typing as the Lord started showing me this, this, this. So here we go. This is how God moves through our obedience. 
This is how he provides a way out and through situations that happen in our lives. Just like in Jonah, the Bible says he prepared a fish, then he caused a worm to grow. Hmm. In Exodus, he created a cloud of fire for night and a cloud by day for the Israelites to see. And then he made manna for the grumbling nation. God's provision out of obedience. For Joseph, he made a way out through a well, then Potiphar's house, prison, and then kingship. And he stood in the very fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who would not bow their knee to the enemy out of fear of their lives. They refused to bow. So who was with them in the flames? The Son of God. He made the way. He shut the mouths of lions for Daniel. That could have gone bad. But it wasn't Daniel's time. And God provided. Shut the mouths of the lions. He made the sun to stand still. He confused and confounded an enemy. He guided a single stone to defeat a giant from a child. A slingshot. God had perfect timing, perfect aim to take down a giant. Out of what? David was obedient to go gather the five stones. I don't know why there was five. But he gathered. Gather five stones? Okay, I'll gather five stones. God had need of obedience. He spoke through a, a burning bush. He split the sea. He raised the dead. He healed the broken. He wet the ground beneath a dried fleece and dried the ground beneath the wet fleece. Only God can do that for obedience. For those who love him, he moves heaven and earth to make a way. He made water come from a rock. He turned water into wine. He fed th thousands upon thousands. And that is just to name a few. A few things where he caused things to work out. And it wasn't always pretty. I mean, if we read further on in the story of David, he carried Goliath's ha head around in a sack for six months. You know that was smelling bad. That was bad stuff, but God had him do it. There was a purpose and a reason. You could go read about it. It's all in here. God has a need for men and women to walk in obedience, just like Ana An Ananias did. In a moment, God said, I need you to go here and do this. Do it. Ananias did it. Can you write that sentence across your heart? Can you call yourself a disciple of Christ? Can people look at your life and say, and there was a disciple named Sandy, and there was a disciple named Brandy, and there was a disciple named Danny and Cindy. Can you do that? It's what sets us apart from the world. And it's what also empowers us to help the world get saved. What does it mean to be obedient in every aspect of our lives? So this, I'm going to step on some toes, but this doesn't tell me not to step on toes. This says to see, say what is true. Are you thinking on good things? That's not just a suggestion. The Bible says think on whatsoever is pure, what is of good report, what is holy, what is noble. The Bible says that. So are you watching trash on TV? If I accidentally look at you, it doesn't mean that I think you are. But are you watching trash on TV? Are you watching people have sex on TV? Are you watching murder scenes where people are getting killed and sliced up and diced and boiled, whatever? Are you watching those things and putting those things in your mind? It does not line up with thinking on good things. You can't convince me that that lines up with thinking on good things or things that are pure and holy. It's not a suggestion. He doesn't think, say, if you want to live a good life for Christ, then you might just think on these things maybe if you want to. He says do it. Think on these things. Do you need to clean your life up a little bit? Do you need to clean your life up a little bit? We all probably do some way or another. If it's not what you're watching, is it what you're speaking? 
Are you dropping F-bombs every once in a while? I'm not trying to be mean. But good and wholesome talk needs to come out of our mouths. Things that are holy need to be coming out of our mouths. Are you gossiping? Are you criticizing? That's not good stuff coming out of your mouth. That's not being obedient. These simple things set you apart. These simple things is what will say, that's a disciple of Christ. What if we opened our Bibles every single day to discover what God would have us to do? And I know a lot of us open it every day. But what if we opened it with the attitude of something in this is going to change my mind about something? Something in here is going to set a new path for how I'm going to live my life today. Something in here is going to change me to my core. Because I don't care if you've read the whole Bible 20 times. There are so many layers to what is in here. Just like the Ananias story. I've grown up in church. I knew the Lord since I was three years old. And I can remember and point to the day when I became saved. So I've heard the story. But last Sunday, I needed to see it different. That my life needs to be holy, and then I need to be able to go and reach the lost for the Lord. I need to be able to touch the people that maybe gross me out. I'm just being real. When people come into the sanctuary here, and maybe they're homosexuals, or maybe they're one of the 65 other things that they can be, can we be Christ and reach out to them? Yes, you can. How? By being obedient in the little things. The little things. Ananias' obedience required an obedience that was walked out and abandoned. We don't see that he went and got a bunch of friends to go with him. We saw that he said, well, this was my concerns, God. God said, I got it. And then Ananias went. And he walked into the house and he said, this is what God told me to do. Brother Saul prayed for him, and allowed God to do the rest of the work. He was obedient. So I started thinking about what is it when, when he says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And I know that sometimes we can think that it's just the Ten Commandments, but like I've said earlier, it's not. John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he keeps my word. My Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. This is the word. We keep the word. If you don't know if something's right, don't do it. Ask God. John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I kept my father's commandments and I remain in his love. So, yeah, you're going to make mistakes, and you're going to fall down, but you're going to remain in his love every time you get back up and you stand in faith and you move forward in that radical obedience of Jesus, what he calls us to do, what God would have us do. 1 John 2, 3, by this we can be sure that we have come to know him. How? By keeping his commandments. We're going to know each other by our fruits, correct? How are we going to know that if you're not living a fruitful life? If you're not walking in the fruit of the Spirit, people aren't going to see that. John, 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And I only took a few of these. John 14, 12, verily I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. If you love me, then keep my commandments. It's all tied together. If I love him, I'm keeping his commandments. And then the scripture says, all things work together for good for those who what? Love. Love. Do you see the picture here that's being painted? So what other commandments do you, do, can we find? So in the, Old, in the New Testament, this is what we see. John 1.12 says, receive me. There's an action. John 1.43 says, follow me. That's a command. 
uh, John 5, 8, he says, get up, crippled man. Another action. Rise from the dead, Lazarus. Believe in the light. Who am I? Believe in God, John 14, 1. Believe in me, John 14, 11. Abide in me. Ask what you wish. Abide in my love, John 15, 9, and receive the Holy Spirit, John 20, 22. Those are just a few of the action words that are there. Abide in me. Follow me. Believe in me. Those are commandments, not suggestions. If you want to, come abide in me. No. Abide in me. And, I'm, and he's going to know that I love him if I'm spending time with him. He's going to know that I love him if I'm opening my word and I'm seeking him daily. He's going to know that I love him if I'm showing grace and mercy to the brothers and sisters in this place. He's going to know that I love him if I don't forsake the gathering of the saints. And while we're on that note, this is not for guilt. But if you can be here Wednesday nights, be here Wednesday nights. Why? Because we're not going to forsake the gathering of the saints. It is an hour and a half. An hour and a half. And I know that sometimes, you know, a lot of us live other places, so that makes it hard. But what I'm saying is for us to grow as a body, we can't forsake the gathering of the saints. And the more that we can be together, the healthier we're going to become. The more that we're going to grate against each other sometimes. The more that we're going to love each other and help each other grow. The more that we're going to be able to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me and move on. It's all what being a family is. It's messy, but it's fabulous at the same time. These commands that I just read to you allow us to be radical, have radical obedience for God. That word radical has really got a bad connotation to it, you know, the radicals. But being radically sold out for God means that nothing else is going to move me. I am standing firm. And when the enemy comes and starts telling me I'm this, this, or that, or that God doesn't love you because your past is so bad, well, I'm telling you, if he could save Saul, who was killing his children, and then save people after that, he can save me. And I know that it's a mind-blowing thing to think about. Somebody once said to me, do you think he saved Hitler? I mean, what if Hitler repented on the last moment? I was like, you know what? That is beyond me. I don't even need to worry about it. Because I have my own opinion, but it wasn't going to help in that moment. What the word says is, if somebody repents and has need of Jesus Christ in their life and they repent and ask him to be Lord and Savior of life, he's faithful to it. And it's not my responsibility to judge. And... Something else I wanted to tell you is <laughs> I used to not want to give my testimony because it's not scary and <laughs> full of dramatic things. And so when I was asked to give my testimony, I'm like, oh, because I had heard all these other women at this event give their testimonies, and they were powerful moments that God had redeemed these women. And I had an older woman say, at three years old, God saving you is just the same thing as anybody else. The hardened biker woman, not you, Sandy, Sandy. I have another girlfriend, <laughs> uh, another girlfriend, and, and she was there. It's the same because his blood shed for her is the same blood shed for me that was shed for Saul. It goes through the ages. There was a disciple named Ginger. That is my goal. I want to be his disciple, and I want to change lives with my obedience. And sometimes it's scary. Sometimes we miss the mark. Pastor John and I miss the mark. Well, we miss the mark often, but this one situation, because <laughs> we're still learning and growing, and he's way older than me, so he should have it already down, I would think. But... <laughs> way older we had gone to this church and we had served we've been serving since i was 17 years old i met him anyway a long time i was 16 when we met 
We started ministry when I was 17. So we've been serving together for a long time. And we were at this church, and we were over this huge department and all these people, and we were the boss of them, and I like to be boss. And I, I <laughs> it's just true. I like to organize and be boss. Danny. Um, I like to be bossy. Okay. God told us after many years of serving there, it's time for you to go. You need, you need to, and it's not that we were offended or anything was going on. My time for you is done here and you need to go. We ignored him. For six months, we stayed where we were not to be. Because we kept thinking, oh, maybe that's not the Lord. It was the Lord, especially because he's telling both of us. But we are, we're digging in thinking, we, we're going to make a difference here. We're going to serve God. And, you know, we're, we're just going to keep on serving. Well, by the time that six months came and the time that we left, it was terrible. By that time, things had blown up that really didn't even have anything to do with us. But when we had to make our exit, it looked like we were leaving for that reason. But it wasn't. But we were disobedient. But we learned. The next time we went into another church and we started wanting to leave, oh, we need to leave, we need to leave, we need to leave. God said, no, you're not going to leave, you're going to stay. Wow, this doesn't fit us, this doesn't feel good. They don't do, what, you know, the things we like, whatever, it doesn't feel good. God said, stay. This time we learned out of disobedience how to be obedient, and so we stayed. And because of that, when it was time to leave, there was blessing that followed obedience in the big things and obedience in the small things do not steal we were at the gas station the attendant gave me a penny too much one cent sam was with me and i was like oh she gave me i got in the car already you know it was hot sweating and she gave me a penny too much oh she's giving me a penny too much and I knew that my little boy's eyes were watching me. And I knew that the Spirit of God was speaking to me already because that penny did not belong to me. A penny. So I got out of the car. I took it in. They mocked me for returning a penny. But I could walk out because I was obedient to what God called me to do. The world is going to mock us. I refused to get in an argument a couple weeks ago with somebody that wouldn't have been there wouldn't have been any benefit of it. So I refused. I turned around and walked away. Not with anybody here. It was in a store. It wouldn't have done any good to argue with a person, so I turned around and I walked away. So then I get mocked for that. It's okay. Jesus took way more than someone making fun of him. And if I follow him, then I need to be prepared for the mocking, right? Right? I want to challenge you today to start looking in your life to see where maybe you're not being obedient. And it's hard to look at those things. And it's hard to confront disobedience in our lives. And then, on the flip side of that, it's hard sometimes to love the unlovable. And it's hard to love the people that have caused so much pain in our families. It's hard. I've walked it. Pastor John has walked it, and I know some of your stories, and it's hard. But we can do all things, and I'm not just throwing that out there. This is true. Every word is true in this. So when he says to me, I can do all things because he's my strength, then I can be like Ananias, and I could go be obedient, put my hands somewhere, and bless somebody that maybe I can't stand and I'm afraid of or whatever it may be. I can do hard things. You can do hard things. But we have to clean our lives up, you guys. We have to live pure to every ounce of your ability. Clean house. Turn the TV off. Watch what you're listening to. Don't listen to things that are not pure and holy. Is that too harsh? I don't think so. If we desire to be disciples of Christ, then we got to clean up what's going on in our hearts. There's things sometimes that I have to repent for on a daily basis until I can totally lay it down. 
when I see this certain woman, I will think bad thoughts in my head because I'm flesh and I have to repent. And then the next time, and I kept repenting and repenting and repenting a lot. And then the next time, all of a sudden, God did something in my heart. And the next time I saw her, I loved her. And I loved her with the love of Christ because I didn't feel it in my flesh. But the Holy Spirit in me rose up when I saw her and I was glad to see her. She wasn't glad to see me. That's okay. It's not about her at that moment. It's me being obedient. Clean it up. If you have something against a brother or sister in here, clean it up. Say you're sorry if you have to. Humble yourself. Think about the humbleness of Ananias going into, the, into Saul. I mean, that is, that is humble right there. If you have offense, clean it up. If you have something to say, say it in love. We're going to grow together. But we have to pursue righteousness. And we have to have the desire to have clean lives before the Lord. So if something comes on TV and he says, this isn't for you, don't talk yourself out of it. Turn it off. You don't need to see it. Even commercials are terrible now. This is the temple of Christ. What goes in here goes in here. I want to watch what honors God. I want to speak what honors God. I want to walk and make the choices in my life to honor God. And I believe that you guys do too. And I know it's hard. You can do it. God's grace. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that your work on the cross was complete. I thank you that you didn't leave anything undone, Lord. I thank you that your blood is applied to me and everyone here in this room, God, and anyone that search, searches for you and seeks you, God. Your blood is for them too, God. I ask that our hearts will be softened to the loss, that when you have somebody that comes across our path, God, that you will fill our mouths with your words and not our words, that we can touch the unlovely, Lord, unlovely, that we can touch the dirty, that we can touch those who, who maybe were afraid of God, but that, that you can look at us and say, and there's my disciple, Ginger. And there's my disciple, John, that we will be your disciples, your tools, because you have need of us to reach the world who you have need of because you desire that none should perish. So, Father, help us to be obedient. Thank you that Ananias was obedient and that we can learn from him, God, that he could hear your voice and respond even though he, was, he possibly was afraid. Thank you, God, that we can um, do things afraid and still have um, the authority of who we are in you. I just pray, God, this week, as we begin to search our hearts, Lord, that you will uncover the things that you would desire that we be rid of. And as we grow together, Lord, may your anointing flow in and out of the brothers and sisters here. And as we don't forsake the gathering of the saints and we reach out to those who aren't here, Lord, that love will abide here as we abide in you. In your name, amen.